Good morning, church. Let us prepare our hearts before the Lord this morning. Let us offer our worship to God because the God whom we serve is the sovereign God. Let us worship Him with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our heart. Let us praise His name. As we sing that song, I stand in awe you, God.
Yes, Lord, thank you, God, for your presence this morning. Thank you, God, for your love and kindness to us, Lord. We are here today, Lord, to offer, Lord, our praises, to offer, Lord, our worship, because we know, Lord, that you are the sovereign God, the creator of all things, the sustainer of our lives. For you alone, Lord, we move. In you alone, Lord, we breath. In you alone, Lord, we live, oh God. We, we give you glory, we give you praise and adoration, Lord, to you, my King. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you ready to praise the Lord, church? Let us clap our hands. Worship Him with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. Hallelujah! As we sing the song, shout, for the King is among us. Shout of the kings of all God. 
oh God. Lord, you are exalted with our praises. No one can compare with you, Lord. You are omnipresent. You are omniscient. You are the all-knowing God, the ever-present God, Lord, the everlasting Father. We exalt your name, O God, because, Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy. We give you glory. We give you our hearts, Lord. We offer, Lord, our lives, our soul, our strength. This moment, Lord, we will exalt, Lord God, your holy name. We will raise, Lord God, your banner on high, Lord. And we will lift your name on high, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
all the glory and honor, Lord, belongs to you alone. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. of who you are. God, you are our creator. You are our God. You are our healer. You are our provider. God, you are our comfort. God, you are our peace. You are our savior. Because of who you are, we are here. So we worship you. We thank you, God, for this morning, for allowing us to come before your presence. Who are we to come before you, your presence? We are not worthy, Lord, on our own to come before you. Yet because of the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross for us and his death and his resurrection, we have this opportunity to come before you. We pray that you will open our hearts and our minds as we come before your word. Help us, Lord, to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. We have so many things to be thankful for in the time when there is a pandemic, a time when people are looking for answers, a time when people are looking for the worst and focusing on the things that they can't control. Yet God is constantly reminding us to go back to His Word. This morning, I want to uh, come to the Word of God where it reminds us of who we are and what we are. The devil is trying to convince us that life is over. The devil is trying to convince us that because of the changes, God is not there. The devil is, con is trying to convince us that God is not enough. Therefore, in this time of pandemic, in this time of suffering, in this time of uncertainties, we tend to look upon ourselves, to, to, to rely on ourselves, and to rely on everything that was given to us, instead of relying on the one who is the one that gave it to us. So I come before you this morning, and first of all, I want to say hi. It's been a while since we've uh, seen you. Uh, I've seen some people here uh, that had been gone for about five months. But praise God for an opportunity to be here again. So I want to challenge you this morning. Don't just believe what I said. Go back to the Bible. So when I say, get your Bible and read, the purpose is for you to hear from God, not from me. I'm here to be able to, to explain to you what the Word of God is, and sometimes it might come from my own opinion. And so we're very careful about using God's Word to form, uh, to, using, you know, to form our op opinion using God's Word instead of just going to the Word of God and believe it. So this morning, I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to talk about what does the church of Jesus looks like? What does the church of Jesus looks like? Now, I'm going to bring this up because nowadays the church looks so different. Five months ago, we actually come into a church building. Five months ago, we actually come and meet each other and talk to each other and shake hands, and all the benefit that we get from the fellowship of what we call church. Now, because of that, we have this, this, we have this idea in our mind that the church is actually like that. And all of a sudden, God changed the direction. All of a sudden, God changed the meaning of church. Now, God is challenging us to go back to the Word of God. What does the church look like in the Bible. Now, we have so many churches in Davao City. In fact, you can, right now, right here, we have about five churches uh, uh, about a few meters from us. 
In our city, there's so many churches, so many different kinds of churches. I remember when I was uh, uh, still traveling uh, with the ministry, and uh, I was on a boat, and a guy asked me, he said, are you a Christian? I said, yes, I'm a Christian, and I'm a pastor. And he asked, and then he asked me, he said, uh, are you baptized? I said, yes, I am baptized in the name of Jesus. The Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost, I'm baptized. I believe Christ as my Savior. And he said, where were you baptized? I said, in this church. He said, oh, oh, brother, you're not saved at all. Because you're not saved, because you're not baptized in certain churches. And so I was like, what? So believing in Christ Jesus is not enough? Oh, no, no, you have to be baptized in a certain church. Hmm. And so a lot of people define church in their own mind. He said, the church is not, you're not a Christian. You're not, you don't belong to the real church if your church doesn't do this. So sometimes we say, the music, oh, that's not the real church. That's too slow. And then this music right oh, it's too crazy. That's not the real church. And so we put these categories to define what church looks like. We have a church of Jesus Christ, the later day saints. This is the, the, the church of Jesus Christ, but doesn't really believe on, on what Jesus did on the cross. We have other church that says we are the only church that can be that can save you. So what does the church of Jesus look like? Let's go back to the Bible. And hopefully, with this chapter, with this passage, we get a comfort of knowing that a church that, we, that looks like church before, you know, it doesn't look like a church in the Bible. And so a lot of people are worrying, you know, in this pandemic now, you know, we can't go to church physically, and we really have to, we have to fight and get to a church. What's the rush? I tell you what the rush is. Because we have this idea that the church has to be like this. Instead of really getting into the Word of God, what does the church look like? The real church. Now that the building is gone, now that not the instrument is gone, now the fellowship is gone, is it still a church? To understand what a church is like, looks like in the Bible, will give us comfort. Will that cause us to depress or stress about what is going on around us? No, it is not cultural. We don't go through culture, we go through the Bible. It has to be biblical. Chapter 16 of Matthew, verse 17. Jesus replied, let me see this. Sorry. Huh. Does it work? It does work. There it is. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by the flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Verse 21, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned Jesus turned, see, and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. 
and you do not have a mind that concerns, you don't have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whatever, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whatever, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will be it for someone to gain the whole world yet for forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. We're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about the church that is built by Jesus Christ. What does the church of Jesus looks like? It is a church that is built by Jesus. In verse, in verse, uh, let's see, 17. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon Peter, of Judah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I will tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you build on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone. It is built by the Lord Jesus Christ. The church is built by Jesus. Yes, in this verse we see some people are confused about what Jesus was saying. Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by the flesh and blood, but by the Father in heaven. Jesus was asking his disciples, Who am I? Who is the Son of God? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And Jesus said, Wow, this was revealed to you by my Father. It wasn't merely on, on Peter's understanding. Peter was not smart in a way where well, he knows everything. In fact, Jesus said, this was revealed to you by my Father. This was not to your merit. It is merit by my Father who revealed it to you. I am the foundation. I am the Messiah. Peter said, you are the Messiah. And Jesus said, it is true. And you could have never known that unless Jesus, unless God my Father, or my Father will tell you who I am. He says, I will build, not Peter. Jesus said, I will build the church. It was not Peter that built it. You know, sometimes some, some, some um, churches that say Peter is the key to heaven. Peter is the only way to heaven. You get to heaven, you know, if Peter doesn't let you in, then you, you won't go to heaven. So Peter has a, more of a higher position than Jesus. When, when Peter declared himself to himself, to Jesus, that Jesus was the Messiah, it wasn't Peter. It is such to say that sometimes when, when some, someone like Peter or someone like anyone that have more understanding or smart will be put higher than Jesus. In here, Jesus was saying, this was revealed to you. I am the Messiah. I will build my church. Jesus did not say, Peter, you will build the church. Jesus brings his people together. Only Jesus can bring the church together. Only Jesus can build the church. Who are the church? We are the church. Not the building. The building is not the church. I am part of the church. And the only thing that we have something in common is Jesus. Because Jesus says, I am the Messiah. So whoever believes that Jesus is the Messiah and accept the fact that he's the only one that can save me, he's the only one that can forgive my sin, is part of the church. You see, Jesus is the one that built the church, not a human being. I will. He will build his church. And so I am part of the body of Christ. 
Because of Jesus, I am part of the church. And so no matter what happens in this world, no matter what kind of pandemic that happens in this world, the fact never changes. The fact remains that Jesus is the one that built the church. He is the one that made it possible to bring everyone together in a church. Did you know that you are part of the universal church? There are churches all over the world who are worshiping Jesus. You are part of that. And that's why, pandemic or not, the church of Jesus did not stop. The church of Jesus did not disappear. I'm still here. We are all still here. We are part of the body of Christ. I will build the church. In 1 Peter 2, 4, 5, he said, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. He said, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by man. He was the living stone. He was rejected by man. But chosen by God and precious also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house. We are a spiritual house. We belong to Christ. He is the one that built the church. Peter did not build the church. Peter died, the church remains. Jesus died, rose again. So isn't that great? Sometimes we, we feel that Jesus is not here. But brothers and sisters, be encouraged. The one that built the church said, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one who built the church Jesus Christ never left the church. And he's still here today. If we have that in mind, if we have the mind that, that understands that this is Jesus' church and that whatever happens to us is not a surprise, but Jesus knows it all. It is built on him. It is built on a firm foundation. Jesus said in verse 7, Blessed are you, Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by a man, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Upon this rock I will build my church. The foundation is firm upon this rock. Jesus is the rock. Peter is not the rock that Christ built the foundation on. It was the, the foundation of Jesus. Jesus is the rock. He is the firm foundation. He said, and I tell you the truth. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Well, sometimes you think, or people think Peter is the rock. Well, in some sense... Peter just did start the church. In some sense, Jesus used Peter to build the church. In some sense, he started the church. Not only with, with the, uh, the Jews, but also the Gentiles. In some sense. But he is not the rock. He is not the firm foundation, as you can see. Peter is not the rock. That we build the church in. It is built on the firm foundation. First of all, it was built by Jesus. It was built firmly. No matter what happens, the church will go on. A lot of, in, in so many years in the past, many people try to destroy the church. Outside the church are trying to destroy the church. Inside, people inside the church are trying to destroy the church. But it is built on a firm foundation. No one can ever trample it. Trample it. No one can ever break it. No one can ever, can ever take away the church because it is built on a firm foundation. Upon on this rock, 
Jesus will build the church. And sometimes we worry, you know, no, what will happen to our church? And I have been to so many churches and, and a lot of worries, like what will happen to our church? We don't have enough money. We don't have a pastor. We don't have all of these resources. If it is built on a firm foundation, no matter what happens, church will stay because it is based on the firm foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The gates of hell will not overcome it. Just imagine it. The gates of hell. And the church is moving. And the gospel is moving. All over the world. Not just here. You see, it is designed, the gospel is designed to spread out. The gospel is not designed to stay. You know, Jesus said, and the gates of hell will not prevail it, will not overcome it. The gates of hell will not overcome it. Sometimes the devil want to put some restrictions on us. A lot of people, a lot of churches are, are staying put, are not doing anything because they are him in here, they were, were, they were staying in because of all the restrictions that you have. The devil is trying to restrict the worship of the king through pandemic. And yet we found a way to act as a real church and to continue preaching and to continue praising God. The devil would like to, to use this pandemic as an excuse for us to not preach the gospel. Therefore, the gates of hell can prevail it. But Jesus was saying, even the gates of hell cannot prevail. The church that I have built, it must go on. Did you know that the work of the devil is to keep us from preaching the gospel? The work of the devil is to keep us from letting people know who Christ is. 3.5 billion people in the world today are still not hearing the gospel, not even once. What are we doing about it? Are we allowing the devil to shut the gospel by not doing anything about it, by not going into the world and preach the gospel, by doing all the excuses that we have because we cannot go, then we're allowing the devil to keep us from preaching the gospel. My friend, this is not the church that Jesus built. It was built on the foundation. It was built on the firm foundation. The, 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 the gospel is about offensive. It's not about defense. The gospel is about to break through the chains. The gospel is about breaking through the hell, the gates of hell. We're not just sitting down and doing nothing because the firm foundation is built on the firm foundation. Either the gates of hell come to us, it will never break us. Or ever us, the gospel, will come through the gates of hell. This is how what we think about. The church is about going out and breaking through the gates and opening doors so that people will hear the gospel so that we can build, we can, we can bring the gospel into these communities and the, the body of Christ will be born and the church will exist. Our job is to believe that we have this firm foundation. Our church is not weak. It is powerful. He said, I will build my church. It is owned by God. My church. It belongs to him. It doesn't belong to me. CFC, Christ Fellowship Church, it's in the name. It, is, it belongs to Christ. And sometimes we act like it is our church. Sometimes like we act like it is for us to make a decision what, what the church is going to do or what the church is going to be, you know, ministering. And there's a danger of us deciding what the church should do. It is a danger in deciding where we should preach or whether we should preach or not. It is not for us to decide, you know why? It is not our church. He said, it is my church. It belongs to him. Not to us. My church, 
It is not our church. Therefore, we are to obey what God is saying. We are to obey what we should be doing with this, with this church that exists. There is a tendency of owning a church. There's a tendency of saying, hey, because of me, the church is here. There's a tendency of saying, because of me, drums are here. Uh, all of these are here. The big church is here because of us. No, you don't understand that this is owned by God. It is my church. I'm not going to, going to build, what, what would happen if I say, Church of Hilmer's family? This is the church of Christ. Therefore, we don't decide. Therefore, we follow what Jesus said. If you say that this is your church, you can decide whatever you want to do with it. You put laws in it. You put, you put things that is comfortable for you. You'll never do anything that's out of your comfort zone. You know why? Because it's your church. But if it's Christ's church, it's different. You know what Christ's church is? It reflects on what Christ did on the cross. He went through the sufferings. He went through the cross. He died on the cross and raised again. That's what Church of Christ looks like. It's not a CC church. We are a church that are willing to go through anything because it is built on firm foundation. No matter what the devil do, the church will go on. And the gospel will be preached among the nations. You know, when we, we, we talk about the gates of hell, it is a stronghold. When, when people talk about gates when, uh, in, you know, in, 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 in olden times, the gates is keeping people from coming in. It's a secure place. It is a place where, you know, sometimes when you have a meeting with, with, uh, with special people, you have a room and it is... It is it is secured. People will watch it. And, and, you know, if you have a very important people in this house, people will secure it. A stronghold. Even the gates of hell cannot prevail it. It's using the word, the gates of hell. It's right to the center of the enemy. Jesus said, this is what I'm here for, to defeat the work of the enemy. Now, the church is not only built by Jesus. It is also sustained by Jesus. Sustained by Jesus. Verse, chapter, no, verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Okay, there it is. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of law, and that he must be killed, and on the third day, may be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Not only did the church was, uh, it was built by Christ, it is, it is owned by Christ, it is sustained by Christ. What do I mean by sustaining it? When we say sustaining it, supported it, finances it, all right, provided for. The, the other idea of sustaining the church is a very different from our sustaining the church. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples. Now, if you really believe, you know, if you really believe that I am the Savior of the world, I'm going to have a new movement, and this is going to be a Christianity movement. I'm going to build my church, and this is how I'm going to build the church. It is going to be owned by me. It is going to be firmed 
and no one can go against it. That's what it's going to look like. How am I going to do that? To their surprise, the disciples were saying, wow, this is our Savior. This is awesome. He's the Son of God. He's going to be fighting for us. And then after that, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go. He must go. He didn't say, I should go, or maybe I should go. He said, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. Here's the problem with this statement with our people. With Simon Peter, he just declared that Jesus was the Son of God, and he was just commended. You know, he was like, whoa, Peter, that was, oh, it was so cool. Jesus said, you know, after this, he said, he's explaining to him what it's going to look like. How am I going to build the church? How am I going to sustain it? He said, from the time on, Jesus began to explain it to his disciples, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. First of all, he must suffer. Through the suffering of Jesus Christ, the church will be built, will be sustained. He must suffer. Really? Really, Jesus? You can't. There's no other way. I mean, you could, you know, you could say, to build the church, I must have power. I can build the church through power. I can just go, church, boom. You know, come to me, boom, happens. But Jesus was doing a different thing. And for the disciples, it's something weird. But this was not a surprise at all. If they know the scripture, they should know that this was coming. Jesus said, I, I, if I am a Messiah, you need to believe that I am the Savior. I'm the Son of God. And because of that, I must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from these people. Suffer many things. Whoever thought that Christianity is about glorious living, living. Whoever thought, whoever, you know, whoever said, you know, that being a Christian is, is taking you away from suffering. We need to go back to the Bible. It is sustained by sufferings. The church goes on because of sufferings. Not because of good things. There's a difference between sufferings and good things. The enemy, the enemy, remember in his temptation, the enemy said, I'll give you all of this. I own this world. I give you all of this. Just worship me. All right, Satan said, I'm going to build my church. Power. All of these things. But the news is for us, if we're going to have a church, if it has to be sustained, it has to be sustained in the suffering of Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, a church that doesn't suffer, I will question. A church that doesn't have enemies, I will question. You know why? Because the church of God, the church of Christ, will always be enemies of the devil. So if the devil is not fighting the church, then I have a question about this church. We expect sufferings because Jesus himself went through sufferings. The chief priest, uh, he said, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised. Not just suffer, killed, but be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Peter, the great Peter, was commended by Jesus. Peter, what you've had right now, what you were thinking about me, what you said about me, what you declare about me as a son of God, and I am a Savior, a Messiah, it could never be, it could never be revealed unless the, 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 the the Father in heaven reveal it to you. So Peter's like, cool. Now I can, I, can, uh, I can speak. Unknowingly, Peter didn't really know that God was speaking through Peter. 
But I think for some reason, Peter was thinking, okay, cool. Now I can, I can, I can really hear from God. All right? I can really speak now. So he said, for me, I, can't, I need to, to be able to picture what Peter did. He, Peter took him aside. Right? Jesus was speaking. He said, I will suffer. I will die. And in three days, I'll, raise, I'll be raised again. Peter probably took Jesus' arm or hand. Uh, Jesus, I need, I need to talk to you. Right? Sit aside from other people. So it was a private conversation. He said, Jesus, I need, I need to talk to you. Come, come here. I don't know if he was going, you know, come here or, Lord, Lord, can I talk to you? I don't know what he did. But the word he used, he said, Peter took aside and began to rebuke him. Now, he just declared that Jesus was the Messiah. He just declared that he is the Son of God, which means you respect that. As Filipinos, we understand that. Respect. All right? And all of a sudden, Peter went into a different mode. He rebuked Jesus. Have you ever rebuked a president? Have you ever tried to rebuke your parents? Peter rebuked Jesus. He said, never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. What is the implication for this? Why is this a big deal? Jesus just said, the Son of Man must suffer. He must go through this. This was the same. He said, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Oh my goodness, that hurts. Jesus was commending Peter a while ago. Now he's reprimanding Peter. Peter, Jesus said, that was cool what you said. You know, the Father talked to you. And now Jesus said, you are now speaking in Satan's term. Get behind me, Satan. He was called Satan. Not only that, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Could it be? Could it be that our understanding about ourselves, could it be that our knowledge and understanding could be a stumbling block to what God is trying to do? The things that make sense to us can be a stumbling block to what God is trying to do. This is Mission Sunday. I'm going to talk about missions. It is a stumbling block to what God is trying to do when we think, we think that we can't afford to do missions. Of course we can't afford to do missions, and that is true. Because missions, it has, if it has to happen, it has to be done in God's way, sustained by God, not by us. Jesus was following the Father's will to go to the cross and die there. Peter was blocking you are a stumbling block to me, Satan. Get behind me. Not in front of me. He was probably talking to Jesus face to face. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Remember again on the temptation of Jesus. Peter, Jesus was saying, Satan was saying, all of this, all this world, I own it. I'll give it to you. Just worship me. You do not have to go to the cross. As if Satan was saying, nah, you don't really have to go to the cross. You don't have to die on the cross. Just worship me and I'll give you all of this. It is contrary to what God was saying, for God to love the world, I'm going to take it back. Jesus came into the world to take the whole world back to him from the hands of the enemy. And the enemy was bribing him with his own world. I own this. This will be yours. Guess what? Sometimes we fall into that category, just like Peter. We become a stumbling block to what God is trying to do in this world. We become a stumbling block to preach the gospel, ourselves, our knowledge, our understanding of who we are. We look at our situation. We can't do this. We, 
No, in our human understanding, and that's what God was saying to Peter. He said, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Your job is not to be in front of me. You're behind me. He said, you are a stumbling block to me. You do not have the mind. Do You don't have in mind the concerns of God. Peter, you are only concerning on your own self. You do not have the mind or the concerns of God. You know what the concern of God is? For God so loved the world. Oh, God is so concerned of His world, of His people who is dying without Christ. God is so concerned of those 3.5 billion people who have not heard the gospel while we are here enjoying our life as a Christian. As a church, we should bleed. Our hearts should grieve that there are so many people today that have not heard the gospel. In our country today, at least, at least each person in our country today in the Philippines will hear the gospel probably seven times a week. The same gospel that's been preached in, in different churches, in radio stations, in music. But there are places in this world today that they have not even heard the gospel, not even once. And that is the concern of God. After all, that's what God is trying to do when He sent His Son into the world to suffer, to die to be raised again in three days. That is the concern of God. What is, what is concerning our minds? What is it that, we, that really occupies our heart, our minds? Do we have the things that concerns God? Is that our priority? Is God's heart our heart? <coughs> as we look at our church, as we gather, do we have the mind or the concern of Christ, or of the Father. He said, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. You are a stumbling block to me by keeping me from dying on the cross, by keeping me from suffering and dying on the cross and raise again. That is the only way you can sustain the church. That's the only way the church stays. When I defeat the power of the enemy through the power of the cross. That's how God sustains His church. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. The more we think about ourselves, the more we think about our concerns, the more we we. we get discouraged and the more we get stressed and depressed but the more we look upon the concerns of God the more our hearts cries for God to use us as his, as, as his instrument to build a church the more we go closer to God and listen from God and get direction from Him but if you have merely the concerns of human mind then we fall into doing things on our own instead of doing things that pertains to the mind of God, the concern of the Father. Third, it is, rest it is retained by Jesus. Retained, kept. It's not taken away. No one can take it out. No one can, can snatch it. It is retained by Jesus. How did he retain the church? It's been 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years that the church exists, and we're still going. It is retained by Jesus. Verse 24 to 27. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come... Okay. If 
Anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he begins the whole world, yet, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I tell you the truth. I say, for what he has done. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone comes after me, he must deny himself. He must deny himself. Denying self is not the same as self-denial. That's two different things. He must deny himself. Not only that God was sustaining his, his, his church, but the way he retains the church, the way it stays is through his disciples. Not only that Jesus was telling his disciples that he will be going to the cross, but now he's transferring that into his disciples. He said, now, look, if you want to be followers of Jesus Christ, he said, Jesus said to his disciples, if you come after me, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. What does that mean? Denying self is not the same as self-denial. Self-denial would be, I like to eat all kinds of sweets. Sweet in the morning, sweet in lunchtime, sweet in the evening. But because I have diabetes now, after five years or ten years, I'm going to deny myself all this sweets. That's what we call self-denial. It stays there, but you deny yourself from eating sweets. Self-denial. So, I want to gain more muscle and less fat. So, I deny myself from eating too much and sleeping too much. And I put more work up. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about self-denial. Look at yourself. And you say, this is me. This is what I have. I am an engineer. I'm a teacher. I'm rich. I'm poor. I am cool. I'm good looking. I got all these gifts. This is me. This is all I have. And that's what Satan is trying to do to us. Look at you, man. Look at you. You, you can do it on your own. Look at you. It's you, man. You did it. You. Jesus said, if you come after me, if you want to come after me, anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Do you know how scary that is? Deny yourself as if you have never existed. As if everything you have is gone. Now you're called Christian, Christian, Christ. You are now identified as Christian, not yourself. You are now gone. The Hilmer is gone. Deny yourself. Only by this denying, first of all, can we have a real follower of Jesus Christ? Anyone that follows Christ and say, I'm a Christian, but still doing things on their own, doing things that they're not supposed to do, then that's not real. Denying yourself. You know, that's what Christ did. He was powerful. He owns the world, but he denied himself of that power. He denied himself of that office and suffered on the cross and died and rose again. We are called to deny ourselves, to forget ourselves. Anyone who comes after me, he just must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross. It did not say that Jesus will take your cross. It did not say in the Bible that Jesus is supposed to carry your cross. It said here, the cross to Calvary. He carried it to Calvary, all the way to death and glory. Deny yourself. I now belong to Christ. And Jesus said, okay, now you belong to me. Carry your cross. No, Lord. People will say, no, no, Lord, I come to you so you can carry my cross. 
Jesus said, no. <laughs> you come to me, you come after me, deny yourself and carry your own cross. Suffer for me. Suffer with me. And we're probably talking all kinds of sufferings in this life. And you could say that you can suffer because of, of your belief, and that's true. And most of the time, that's, what hap that's how, what, what's happening in the world today. People are dying because they believe in Christ. People are losing family because they turn to Christ. People are being persecuted. And there's things are taken away from them from the government because they, they, they rather follow Christ. They suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. They carry their cross and follow Christ and follow me. He said, do not carry your cross and follow you. Follow me. Follow me all the way to death and to life. This is how it is sustained, people. The church of Christ will continue on. Not only that, because it is, it is established by God or it is firmly established by God and it is sustained by God, but it is because of the people who follow Christ, who deny themselves and, and, and carry their cross and no matter what, they will follow Christ. Now, there's another suffering that we're, take, we're talking, taking care of, we're talking about, and the sufferings of our normal life here on earth. And I can assure you that if you're a Christian, the daily things that you have, the daily mundane, mundane that you, the daily things that you have to go through, if you are the follower of Jesus Christ, it has to be done God's way. So example, if you're suffering financially, now you're suffering right now financially, How do you suffer from that? You could choose your way and say, I'm going to steal and take care of my finances. Or you can cheat. You could do that. Or you could do it God's way. To be honest and just trust. Work hard and trust God that God will guide and, and, and provide for you. You could do that. Or you could complain that God is not here and is not taking care of you. If you suffer because you want to do the, the right thing because you are God's people, then that is part of that. The essence of suffering, the end of it, is, is where you need to know why you're suffering. You're suffering because you're following Christ, and that is valid. But, but, but if you're suffering because you're doing something not supposed to be what you're supposed to be doing or not God's will, then it doesn't really count. For whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Mission will never ever happen unless we have people who... who, who come after God, who comes after the mind of God, the agenda of God, the heart of God, and deny himself and say, Lord, I have this life. I'm going to give it up, and I'm going to follow whatever you want me to do. And with that, sufferings. When you serve God, when you become a missionary, you will suffer. Even if you do not become a missionary, if you're staying here and you say, Lord, I want you as a priority, and I will preach the gospel, and I will follow you, I will deny myself, you will suffer. Not just missionaries, not just pastors, we will all suffer. You know why? We are designed for it. As Christians, we suffer because we follow Christ. We suffer because we do not want to take the easy life, the easy way out, which is the devil. The work of the enemy is always an easy way out. If we take the easy way out, then mission will never happen. 
We need people, we need missionaries, pastors, or believers to, to come together and, and say, we want to do the mind of God. We want to do the heart of God. And that, my friend, how the church can be retained. It will stay that way. And God designs it that way. It will stay on. No one can snatch it out. All we need to do is to really follow God's formula. So what does the church of Jesus look like? The church of Jesus is built. Huh, forgot about that. The church of Jesus is built by Jesus. It is sustained by his sufferings and his death and resurrection. And it is retained by his followers around the world. That's what the church of Jesus looks like. Be encouraged. This is not the end of the church. The church did not stop. The work of God did not stop. The fellowship of the believers did not stop. The work of God in your life did not stop because of the pandemic. And mission will not stop because of the pandemic. It will go on. Since this is Mission Sunday, I would encourage you or I would invite you to pray with me. Let's pray for the world who have not heard the gospel. A couple of days ago, someone asked us, someone, I asked someone, I said, can you, can, do you think we have enough churches in Davao City that can take care of the people who have not, heard, who have not received Christ? And, they said, and she said, no. I think we have enough churches and believers in this city that can take care of those who do not believe but have heard the gospel. Therefore, I pray for this city that the Christians, the brothers and sisters in Christ, will rise up and continue to preach the gospel. But also, it is my desire to pray for missionaries that will come out of this city, from this church, a missionary that will come out from this church, to do the work of God in the areas where the gospel is not being preached today. Think about it. The pandemic have killed millions of people. And some of those people have died without Christ, without even hearing the gospel. It is not fair that for us who already have the gospel have not made that impact in 3.5 billion people in the world who are still in need of the gospel. What can we do? Such a huge, huge work. First thing is, deny ourselves. Come before God and say, Lord, use me with whatever you want to do. Use me for your glory. And that, my friend, will go a long way. So pray with me this morning as we come before the Lord and close this message. Father God, thank you so much for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you that because of your word, we are reminded that you are the one who owns the church, who built the church, that you are the one that sustained the church and not us, that you will provide everything that we need so the church will go on, and that you are the one that retained the church by, by us who follows you, by believers, believes in you, follows you, and do your will. Lord, we do not want to be like Peter who at that time didn't have the mind of Christ. We become a stumbling block of what God is doing. And as we read on in, in the Word of God, Peter have turned and really have the mind of Christ and also have your agenda and even died for you and suffered for you and preached the gospel. We want to be like Peter, Lord, who in the beginning do not understand what you plan in our lives are, but now understanding that we are to have 
the agenda of God in our hearts and our minds. Without excuse, no matter what, even with this pandemic, we have to find a way and pray to find a way to be able to preach the gospel. Or maybe prepare the way of those missionaries that will be coming out after this. Lord, I pray for anyone right now listening, that if you're calling them to be missionaries, to prepare themselves now, to say yes to you, to deny themselves of all the things that they have in this world, and come before you, pick up your cross, and follow you to the ends of the earth, to death and to life. I pray for our church, Lord, that we will have the agenda of God, that we will have the mind of Christ to preach the gospel where the gospel is needed. We pray for our missionaries today that we have supported here in CFC, that you will continue, Lord, to strengthen them, keep them from being sick, provide for their needs, strengthen them, encourage them in their sufferings, and that through their sufferings, people all doors will be opening. People will know you. I will pray for the missionaries that we have here that are trying to live in our church. The Rubius family trying to, to get themselves ready to go. Pray that you will sustain them, provide for them. And that, Lord, you will provide the way for them to finally be made, to finally be in Thailand to preach the gospel. To live there among the people and preach the gospel. Finally, Lord, we pray that as we live our lives every single day, that we will deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and rejoice in the suffering, and follow you. Not follow us or not follow anyone else but you. We come before you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week. God bless.
Thank you.